Hello and welcome to another episode of Cliff Notes, where we uh, ask a leader and uh, learn the way. Uh, tonight we're talking to Sam Watts from Make Real, the uh, Director of Immersive Technology. Uh, good evening there, Sam. Good evening, Tristan. How are you doing? I'm good. Good. Yourself? Uh, yeah, very good. Um, we had a big, exciting day today, which unfortunately I can't talk about just yet, but um, it's bringing a smile to my face. So, sounds promising. Um, you seem to have been doing doing well for for good releases and and good good work. Uh, taking a review of your your end of year posts. It's been uh, a great year in 2016, um, especially in terms of VR and where we are at. Um, it, there was a lot of hype around the technology, and I think this year is very much a year of re- realization. But um, actually, making things happen rather than just blowing things up and making them bigger than what they could be cool so you feel that that sort of gaming sort of show show real piece has has moved on and and people are finding good practical applications for it i think very much so but also down to the fact that the commercial releases of the headsets with the actual oculus rift and htc vive and well to a certain extent the sony playstation vr all actually being available in the shops themselves to buy with warranties and everything else has made a lot of corporates and companies much more comfortable in getting involved with the technology rather than the sort of mess of cables and uh, dev kits and constantly moving goalposts of the SDKs and everything. It f- feels more like a consumer product than a, than a, than a dev kit. Yeah, very much so. And um, now we just need to work on... Well, not we personally, but but the industry are working on removing the cables from the headset to the PC and making it wireless and inside-out tracking and a lot more user-friendly, accessible um, advancements coming this year and next year. Great. So maybe you could um, just cycle back and uh, give us a little introduction of, of who you are and, and um, what Make Real are up to. So Make Real... Uh, as a company, um, was a rebranded uh, 3D department of Make Media Limited, um, a company who's existed in Brighton for about a decade now. And um, uh, the 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 purpose of the rebranding was to focus upon our emphasis on immersive technologies, uh, whereas Make Media's main focus is web and big data. Um, so. It was just a lot clearer um, from a marketing and sort of op- uh, online presence exactly what the two sides of the company did. So, Make Real, the three D team, have been uh, working with with simulation for for a decade as well, starting off in the construction industry and full flight training simulation side of things. And uh, about twenty twelve, when the Kickstarter for Oculus Rift came about. And cheap, um, high quality, low, well, high quality, low cost uh, virtual reality headsets became a viability. Uh, we sort of pivoted into focusing much more onto the what we call capital VR as opposed to the, the lowercase VR, which is what we used to do with the big screens and multi channel projectors and uh, uh, very large space consuming uh, installations. <laughs> that brings brings me back to my uh, university days of um, reading uh, Myron Kruger's Artificial Reality Two and uh, and dreaming of uh, building my own caves. Yeah, I did go into a cave in ninety seven in Salford Uni and uh, shutter glasses and a bit of VRML running, and I thought this could be the future, but it gives me a really bad headache. And um, when uh, the Oculus Rift first came out and first got announced and Obviously, today, computers are much more powerful and 3D graphics are fully textured and lit and everything else in real time much more believable than uh, we've actually got to the stage of what we wanted with um, sort of matrix levels. Yeah, re- reach the future. Um, so so you're a, you're a ho- wholly separate company um, now rather than just a, a, a department. So you've got your own, um, your own focus on, on this area. Um, is that right? Yep, um, we are still part of Make Media, um, but uh, we are operating and, and, and we we treat ourselves as a wholly separate company. Um, 
with our own goals and objectives and targets and um, uh, uh, deadlines to to work towards in terms of uh, growth and partners and and client base. Um, And we've gone from a couple of small scale little VR projects to um, sort of working into sort of uh, seven figure targets and very large amounts of um, uh, uh, budget per project and probably about 75, 80% of our focus is now entirely with AR and VR uh, projects and clients. Okay. So, I mean, if, if there's a, uh, I'm working with a, a client or the, the sort of corporate uh, listening um, uh, companies to this, I mean, what what sort of an, a, an engagement or I mean, what's a typical sort of length or sort of scale of engagement, just to give them an idea of uh, what does it look like if they wanted to engage in something like this? Well, there's a big common misconception around 3D and especially with virtual reality because everyone assumes it's going to be very expensive and it's going to take ages to create. But um, typically our, our, our projects and, and products that we work on with clients and partners generally last between, I would say, four and six months. Um, some are a bit longer and a bit larger. Um, and then some can be very quick turnarounds where we've done a couple for EDF, for example, where um, it, we started on it the first day back from New Year and it was delivered at the end of January. Right. So, so they they become much more um, uh, much more rapid. It, it, it's not that you have to have an R and D budget and uh, and set someone aside uh, for a few years and wait for something to come back. No, the technology is moving very quickly, and we do 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 a lot of R&D on the fly and uh, where we can incorporate R&D into the budget. But we've been doing R&D for it, w- with VR for the past four years now. So um, we we don't call ourselves experts because with, with the pace of the technology changing, nobody can really be an expert. Uh, but we are certainly specialists and uh, very knowledgeable in terms of design of, of what does and doesn't work. Um, and we'll work with our partners and clients to ensure that um, they are getting the best value for their money, but also um, making the most appropriate use of the technology. And it's not just using VR for VR's sake. Indeed. So, I mean, if, if, if I mean, some of the partners I work with are, are very experienced sort of CAD and CAM um, users or, or work with sort of 3D scanning software to, to sort of prototype and, and, and then work up um, parts uh, for production. Um, is there some sort of crossover? I mean, can, can some, some people who have libraries of parts uh, and are looking to, to get more into a space and more interacting with them, um, is there a possibility to sort of transition um, that work? Yeah, very much so. A number of our partners, they will provide us uh, the schematics and um, CAD models of their products that we will take straight into VR. Um, There's generally a fair bit of uh, uh, optimization needed because we don't necessarily need to have it so that each, every individual bolt and nuts can be uh, interacted with. Um, the, uh, The meshes can be uh, simplified and, and and optimized down for for lower poly counts to ensure we hit our frame rates, um, but it obviously depends how detailed and what levels of interaction they want really. Uh, but we would much rather work with existing accurate CAD models rather than having to take a series of photos and actually create you know uh, the three D content from scratch. Okay, that makes sense. So, I mean, could you? Uh, give us a bit more detail or sort of around um, an example that you found has, has worked well or something you've been working on. Um, so one of our clients, they specialise in creating um, from the perspective of full flight simulators, a modular flight simulator where um, rather than having a flight simulator that is designed and built purposely to be a Boeing 777 or an Airbus 320, they can actually, um, in in their terms, hot swap the cockpits out. Um, and what I mean by full flight simulator is, you know, the big white boxes that bobble around on legs for pilot training. 
yeah, yeah. Um, and um, this whole process, it does actually take about two weeks, but um, it's still quick in uh, in the overall sort of world of full flight simulators and bespoke uh, dedicated uh, systems and hardware for each cockpit. Um, but uh, obviously the, the simulators exist because airplanes are very expensive, um, but the simulators themselves are very expensive. So we create VR and 3D versions, uh, sort of accurate simulators of the simulators, as it were, so that you can still get um, elements of training with the simulator that counts because of the accuracy and the responsiveness and um, the representation in VR. Um, so pilots can actually have a... They can still be clocking up training hours outside of the simulator in a simulated simulator in VR before they go into the actual simulator, before they go into the planes. Okay, so that may, maybe that uh, allows you to scale up. Say, if you have uh, sort of classes of uh, of sort of uh, younger apprentices or, whatever, or younger students, um, you may be able to provide uh, more of them uh, with with time uh, rather than one at a time in a in a much more expensive uh, simulator. Sure, um, and also you know, sort of training how the simulators work or um, need to be maintained because the simulators are so expensive. You know, we're talking a few million pounds each. Um, they need to be running all the time with booked time to 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 generate their revenue. Um, whereas obviously a VR PC, um, you're looking at sort of six seven hundred quid for the headset and about a grand for the PC itself. Um, you can get many of those with the content. Um, obviously, there's a cost of creating the content, but once you have that, you can just duplicate it across a whole variety of bank of VR PCs. Indeed, possibly more more possibility to to repurpose that should that be needed, or or upgrade it than than necessarily something that's been uh, uh, purposely kitted out just for for one one use. Yeah, sure. And similarly with the three D assets that that we use, um, we do most of our work and um, cr- development in uh, in Unity, um, and that supports thirty two different platforms, so that we can spit a build out uh, on. PC, Mac, and Linux, and um, Oculus, and HTC, and Sony PlayStation, and Google Cardboard, and uh, iOS, uh, even BlackBerry and Windows Phone, it, it, if needs be. Um, and one of the projects that we did for uh, EDF Energy, which is a series of, of, of training tools about the fundamentals of nuclear power, um, we were able to reuse and repurpose a number of 3D assets based around uh, the components of nuclear power stations across a whole suite of uh, learning tools quickly, which reduced cost and sped up development time. Okay. And and what sort of uh, users did they have that? Was that for staff or for, for event training or what was that for? As for internal staff, um, so they're training all of their staff. It's kind of an onboarding process to get everybody up to speed with what they're doing down at Hinkley Point C. Um, and they have a beautiful new campus down in Somerset um, where they've converted a uh, grade one or two listed building, um, counting courts into a centralised sort of digital training of the future centre, um, and they've filled it full of um, uh, sort of uh, potential um, digital training technology and tools uh, from AR and VR and interactive screens and. Um, uh, uh, various different sort of computer-based training uh, beyond just flat screen e-learning um, as a showcase of what's possible and um, to to focus on, on the fact that they're very much a forward-thinking um, a company wanting to um, encourage the best, brightest, youngest people, well, young young people to get involved. Okay, so um, they they found that um, this can be also a, a sort of uh, a selling point or a encouragement to to educate and and bring people on when they see what's possible. Very much so. Um, looking at 
obviously the work the workforce and people entering the workforce are growing up with gaming and uh many more digital devices than than when we were growing up and they expect and understand technology a lot better and and they will find it appealing uh the the companies who can um have the technology tools available for learning and within the workplace um to allow them to work more efficiently and uh, uh in a much more engaging manner indeed uh, i mean just that that hands on nature gives must give much better uh, return to to people's retention and and especially for for areas that are more sensitive or um you wouldn't normally get to interact with until you are much further into a, a training program well sure um the there's various studies that show in terms of learning and knowledge retention and um uh, data recall is all based around the depth of the memories that are created and through VR, uh, through greater immersion and presence uh, within the actual content itself, um, achieved by having multiple senses uh, uh, absorbed uh, by the content, then these these deeper memories are formed, which makes for greater learning engagement and um you know, people uh, they have better mem better memory recall and able to you know, sort of score higher in the tests at the end so i mean do you do you take that on too and 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 get out into the communities yourselves um to to educate um people for for just that wider understanding of of this sort of technology and what's possible quite a lot of our work is education based at the moment in terms of allowing people to understand the possibilities of VR. Um, there's a lot of hype last year and there's a lot of people popping up saying that it's kind of the magic bullet and it's the wonder tech and it will solve all your problems. And uh, a lot of people just selling VR because that's the current market hype that they want to be getting into and try and make a quick buck out of. But um, we... If we've based our whole business on uh, VR, um, then we need to ensure that we don't release anything that potentially damages that because we're still at a stage where 9 out of 10 people still haven't tried VR. So if their first experience is uncomfortable or not particularly well uh, designed and uh, difficult to use, um, barriers to entry, etc., then they're going to be put off and all we're doing is harming the potential adoption of VR by the mass market as a whole. And then obviously that hits the company uh, uh, prospects as well. So we do a lot of education in terms of what is VR, the different types from Google Cardboard to Gear VR and the mobile VR side of things up to Oculus Rift and HTC Vive, the room scale, um, uh, sort of full VR as it are, um, and what it can and can't be, well, most of what it can be used for, and we'd always work with each client and partner to ensure that what they want to achieve is actually enhanced and uh, achievable realistically uh, and effectively by using VR. Okay, okay. Um, and uh, you're just saying then that um, this stuff is... You must be taking it on the road and and and, and carrying it around, and uh, something that is the size of a, a sort of a PC and and and, and lenses uh, must be fairly portable. Does that mean it it sort of it can lend itself to sort of trade shows and and being taken around, um, or is it an office based uh, tool? Um, I mean, well, there are there are VR ready laptops these days. Um, we don't have any yet, but um, they're. Um, you're kind of looking at a couple of thousand pounds for one of those, um, but there are small form factor PCs that are VR ready, um, and we have a um, a flight case, peli case uh, system where um, it's got two layers: one which the PC and keyboard and mouse and various sensors and tripods and gubbins fit into, and then the top layer has the Rift and the Vive and controllers. Uh, in it um and it's fairly portable um but it's very well protected for 
uh, going abroad if necessary, or uh, we do a lot of travelling around um, back and forth with London and down in Bristol and uh, wherever clients and partners may be to do to do a demonstration. Um, and it is fairly. Uh, it takes takes me twenty minutes to set up, um, but it is much better when you can actually dedicate a space to it and have the sensors mounted to walls rather than tripods that can be easily knocked by by people watching, etc. So, I mean, if I was uh, taking it to a manufacturing event at, at say, the Birmingham NEC, um, it, it is, it's the sort of thing that you could run on a stand, but it's going to be more efficient if you've got a, a fixed space. Is that the... Yeah, well, our very first project was for... Uh, our very first VR project was for RS Components when they were first launching in China uh, back in 20... I think the actual event was 2014. Um and uh, we created a four-player network racing game that was their booth attractor, um, and we worked very closely with their booth designers and booth organisers to incorporate the technology so that it would be out of sight, minimal fuss, easy to set up, um, easy for um, the brand ambassadors and uh, booth operators just to get people in, um, make the experience very simple to understand and very easy to use. So there's no complicated controls or anything they had to uh, describe. And um, overall, it was designed around five minutes from a a booth attendee sitting down, having the experience, and then taking the headset off and and leaving again. Um, and that was five minutes in and out times four. So it was very very popular. It was so popular that. Um, they, the the organiser organisers of the trade show, um, Electronica, um, were threatening to cause uh, to threatening to close down the stand quite often because of the crowds of people waiting to have a go. That's great, and I mean, are they then? I don't know whether that would come back to you, but they do they get in some some good brand feedback and stuff afterwards rather than just people come along to play a game and and and, and they they think they've just played some some PlayStation or whatever and walked away again? Uh, no, it, it was a, it was a customized experience. It was very clearly obvious, um, RS related. There were brands and products logos within the experience. Um, and, uh, it, it made the company look like a very, you know, exciting company to be involved with, um, who were future thinking, you know, forward thinking, um, and on the cusp and uh, on the edge of technology, so they you know they were very um, impressed and very happy with all of the feedback and sort of positive uh, image that the company had uh, as a result. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I mean, have you found you said you're doing some sort of research and things around this? I mean, is there a, a sort of age or is there a, a lower or upper limit, or does it work sort of better with with with, is it just for kids or uh, can uh, yeah, 30, 40, 50 year olds uh, is quite happily use this sort of system? Um, I get equally harassed by my young niece and nephew to, to, to have a go with the latest kit whenever they come over, um, as I do by my 85 year old grandma um, who um, has tried everything from DK1 to DK2 to commercial Rift and Gear VR um and sony playstation um uh i think um there's always going to be a challenge um when something looks very techy um so we have also done some work with mcdonald's to help them promote um the educational side of things and their their supply chain um and driving a big truck around um the agricultural and countryside shows to encourage young progressive farmers to get into their educational program and become suppliers in the future. Um, we have a virtual reality based competitive potato harvesting uh, experience, um, which it's, it's aimed at the younger people um, because they are the ones who they want to get into the education side of things. And you get a lot of mums and dads looking at it and they see the kids being very excited about it and they're kind of like oh, it's, it's gaming it's for the kids 
Um, but then it depends upon the nature of the show. Um, you get just as many adults who are also similarly excited by it and want to have a go. So um, it really comes down to your expected attendee um, sort of mentality and technology um, friendliness, I guess. And then just taking it a little bit bit wider, then, um, I mean, this is a, a sort of, it's, it's not just a, a thing that's happening in the UK, it's sort of a worldwide uh, product and, a, and sort of worldwide releases, sort of scales of things. Um, has, I mean, has do the, the sort of changing changing landscape of the world or is there sort of better or worse parts of the, the world that are picking up this sort of technology and working with it? Um, I think uh, there's a lot of investment opportunities in um, in America, especially obviously around Silicon Valley. Um, there's a lot of VR startup companies over there. Um, but then I think there are a lot more um, VC investment orientated in terms of how businesses operate, um, uh, quickly get a value and uh, get investment and um, expand and uh, hopefully not become a unicorn. Um, but um, uh, India is very popular, but China's absolutely huge and massive VR market now. Um, and it's just the usual case of how do you do business in China and whether you have access to uh, Chinese companies who have publishing capabilities, etc. cetera. Um, but uh, there, there's one area in terms of uh, getting around the problem of VR in terms of the space, potential space requirements and smaller homes and costs of, of bringing it home. Um, China has uh, is certainly leading the way in terms of the virtual reality arcade concept, where um, whereas we think of arcades dying out um, and none... Well, maybe one still being uh, in existence on 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 West Street, um, with a, a a a sorry selection of cabinets, but the arcade, the VR arcade with dedicated spaces and three by three meter play spaces mapped out, um, buying a time slot um, to experience the latest VR technology is very much a a, a solid business at the moment. So almost like a karaoke experience, sort of uh, a pay, pay for a room and, and, and go and experience a ride sort of thing. Yeah, pretty much um, like a theme park, um, very much that, that kind of idea. Um, some of them just have games that are available for the home market, but then there's some larger ones uh, such as The Void where they're actually creating huge you know, multi-million uh, bespoke content experiences based around you know, Ghostbusters or um, various uh, other film properties. So there's, there is a very much a sort of growing uh, sort of gaming space as well as the sort of the commercial sort of applications of it um, to sort of take on and, and work with uh, the sort of home consoles and things. Is that where it's going to? Well, there's been a very large push with gaming since the resurgence of VR. I mean, we have to remember, obviously, this is about I think the third or fourth cycle of VR. It's not anything new, really. It's just cheaper, faster, better. Um, but um, there's certainly uh, a big push for gaming. But I think most of the analysts predict that you know, by 2020, gaming may well be uh, only a quarter of the market. Um, it's very difficult to make money in the gaming sector for VR at the moment just because of the relatively low user base overall in terms of installed units. Um, PlayStation have announced recently that they are close to selling a million. Um, the other headset manufacturers haven't released numbers, um, but I think um, PlayStation have a bit of a lead. Um, and it's just a case of globally... One million units isn't really a great deal to, you know, base a whole business on in terms of making gaming products, which is why a number of studios, ourselves included, you know, mostly focus on the non-gaming aspect and working with 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 partners and clients 
um, in a more traditional style rather than releasing paid products. So you're finding that um, the, the the work that you're working on is is in the UK or with UK partners or have you been working with, with people a bit more broader? Uh, it's been mostly in the UK, um, but there's nothing stopping us from, from working abroad. Uh, we do have US partners and we do have some French partners. Um, and in the past, we've deployed and worked with uh, companies in Australia. The The world is only getting smaller to a certain degree with with digital technology, so there's no reason why we can't work with partners abroad. It just comes down to availability and uh, suitability, really. Mm-hmm. So you haven't suffered from any sort of uh, import-export issues or sort of licensing issues that sort of slowing you down or um, sort of affect uh, affecting the stuff that you're seeing? Uh, not so far. When we work abroad, we generally find hardware vendors uh, within that locale. Um, so we're not exporting anything from the UK um, in terms of equipment, but in terms of uploading builds and providing software, it's not a problem. I mean, and um, just because some of the the people I work with are a bit sensitive to sort of um, cloud hosted or security to of the systems. Um, I mean, is is the is the are these sort of products the sort of things that are working locally, or are they um, sort of uh, internet connected or um, sort of remotely hosted um, properties? Um, so some of the games that we create, they have multiplayer aspects where the actual multiplayer servers and the matchmaking is all done in the cloud, but then that allows us to release the title cross-platform so we can maximise the opportunity for higher sales revenues from unit sales uh, because everyone can play uh, on Oculus or HTC or PlayStation and then all play against each other rather than segregating them off into their own little walled um, section of, of, of user bases. Uh, but in terms of actual VR deployments as a whole, because of the power of the PCs needed, um, there's not like a cloud delivery service. It, the software and the experience and the content is installed locally on each PC. Um, they can be networked locally um, either within a you know closed local area network or um, online, um, but um, it's 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 becoming more more social and more partners are looking for uh, uh, networked multi-user social experiences rather than just a single user using one PC on their own with nobody else connected to that um uh, environment mm-hmm. that's cool um and and so what what are you seeing as the the um just a sort of last last point of sort of looking a bit further out i mean what's what are the the sort of horizons or what's who's who's doing some sort of uh cutting edge stuff um well most of the, most of the sort of uh, emerging sort of uh, interesting stuff at the moment is based around the hardware and as i say removing the cables and making it wireless um and incorporating some of the microsoft hololens uh technology into vr headsets so they have inside out tracking and they can actually scan the room and work out your position rather than having to have sensors or laser base stations uh causing extra clutter and um, allowing things to be untethered and the user to be more free. Um, and then improving controls and Facebook are looking at um, haptic gloves and um, much more natural hand input um, or just improving overall ergonomics and reduction in size um, and then whether to increase the field of view because uh, research shows that peripheral vision and fast moving uh, content there um, is what can cause nausea, but people want wider fields of view. But then it's that sort of battle of um, beating the uh, sort of stigma of VR causing causing sickness. Um, the technology itself is pretty much there in terms of defeating that. A lot of sickness now comes down to badly designed experiences um 
But um, there's a range of uh, technical challenges ahead, um, foveated rendering and optimization in, in, in rendering higher resolution scenes uh, more effectively um, and being able to stream it um, over the internet uh, live, that kind of thing. Um, and various techniques of determining where best to render at a high resolution and uh, discard data when we know that the, the the user isn't looking that way, but being able to quickly flip between the two when they quickly move their head uh, somewhere else. So it's sort of the the technology is, is there to be used, but um, just the the hardware vendors need to to sort of catch up a little bit, um, but but also sort of design practice. Um, is there too the just just learning to design better and and design for these sort of new still new experiences when they're moving that fast and and uh, that creative? Yeah, very much so. And it's just a case of um, partners and clients being willing to come on a journey with us. Really, um, it's all very exciting. And it's very if they're technologically minded and they can appreciate the challenges that we're breaking down and and uh, defeating in terms of usability and uh, immersion and, and uh, interactions. Um, it's a whole new set of design challenges, which um, to a degree have been uh, or haven't changed from the earlier days of VR, um, but now there's a lot more freedom and higher resolutions and higher quality of content possible um and everything just needs to happen a lot quicker bring me bring me back to thinking of uh, what it was like to stand in the trocadero and uh, and look at probably <laughs> probably only a few hundred polygons uh, uh on screen and and try and figure out where you were on a chessboard as some <laughs> abstract shape um compared to the what's possible now yeah very much so i mean um it's actually i was looking at some of the old photos from the 90s vr and Many of the headsets are actually quite a bit smaller than what we have today, but um, just in terms of screen resolution and refresh rates and latencies, they were pretty bad. Um, and obviously the, the, the computers driving them weren't capable of the fully textured real-time lighting, uh, dynamic shadow uh, capabilities we have with Unity and Unreal and graphics processors these days. It's been been great talking to you today. Wondered whether you had anything else you'd like to to share about the company, or, or where where people can uh, can come and see you, or, or get in contact if they're they're looking for uh, possibilities. They can either follow us on Twitter and Make Real Three D. Uh, we're on Facebook as well, Make Real VR. Uh, we have a website, Make Real uk. Uh, we're currently in New England house uh, with a load of space with a big VR demo area set up. Um, I'm always happy to uh, educate and uh, allow people to come and try out the technology or you can find me at um, a variety of uh, VR based Brighton events Um, there's the Digital Catapult VR meetups um, every other month I think pretty much I think the next one's probably in May at the moment Um, or I'll be at VR Connects which is in mid-April down in Bristol um uh or you'll probably see me around um carrying big boxes of funny looking headsets around <laughs> well look forward to uh to bumping into you in in, in brighton and uh, uh see if i can uh, assist you <laughs> carrying it around or uh, uh come and have another go that sounds good thanks for your time then brilliant thank you for listening to another episode of cliff notes if you want to get in contact with us or you have some feedback for our guest then please do so on the Holding Bay website holdingbay.co.uk or reach out to me on Twitter at at Tristan Bailey or the company at at the Holding Bay thank you